So, uh, thank you all for coming. Today we have uh, Rudy Grimm from Austria, Innsbruck, uh, who's one of the leading scientists in the coal essence. Uh, he started his career in Heidelberg, uh, where he was an associate professor, and then in 2000 he went to Austria, Innsbruck, who is a full professor, and today he's the director of the institute, I think. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and he has one, he's one of the, the big uh, experimentalists in the field of coal atoms, as I said. So because of that, he's won many awards. He's won the Wittgenstein Awards. He's been the Austrian of the year in the year 2005. He's been the scientist of the state of Tirol. And uh, also Austrian scientist of the year 2009. He's won the Fadeo Medal. Uh, for his work on two-body physics in the Fimov states, and last year he won the ESC Advanced Brand. And uh, he's also uh, won the DEC Senior Award, which is an award that's given out every second year in the field of coal atoms to one of the leading scientists in the field, and we got it last year. Uh, so his research has been one of the pioneers in DEC physics. He created the first cesium DEC, he created the first molecule DEC together with David Jin. Uh, he's also worked a lot on ultra cold atomic uh, Fermi gases, strongly interacting Fermi gases, so this whole business about the BC, BCS crossover, he was one of the guys together with Keta Lee and David Jin, doing a lot of collector modes and radio frequency uh, spectroscopy, which today we now think a standard method, <coughs> but we those. Uh, he also, as I said, he won this FADE award, which was given uh, due to his work, I guess, on the chemo physics. Uh, so these are, I don't know whether we have any of the Pimo guys here in the audience, but these are three-body states, so even if you don't have a two-body bound state, you can have three-body bound states, and they will, those will be taken by the Pimov, and <coughs> what were first seen unequivocally in cold uh, atomic gases by uh, And uh, now he's very active in impurity physics, as we also are here. So he works mostly on the Fermi polaron, uh, and I guess he's going to tell us about that today. And also he will tell us about his new directions into exotic uh, superconductors, I think, new superconducting phases with new Fermi-Fermi mixtures and booster Fermi mixtures. So let's say welcome to Rudy and the see you yours. It's so great to be here. Thanks a lot for inviting me to this uh, colloquium. I really enjoyed coming to Denmark. In particular, when I crossed the border yesterday with train, I could take off the mask. <laughs> it really feels differently. So sometimes I get nervous because I don't have a mask here, but I think that's not a problem here. OK, uh, so you see a um, little impression of Innsbruck, special place in the mountains. I have a winter background slide, which is this one. It's not no longer realistic now. I mean, now it's snow still there on top of the mountains, but not in the valley. I also have a summer slide, so this is a transition that we are now making from winter to summer. And all times of the year, it's a nice place to visit. And um, I'm at two institutions, the University of Innsbruck and at the ICOFO Institute of Quantum Optics and Quantum Information of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. So, okay, how to start? Maybe I start with looking back into history, 20 years, roughly 20 years. And one of the really very important experiment which changed the game, which made a new era to begin. And that's an experiment that's by the John Thomas group carried out at Duke <coughs> University. And this is an optical dipole trap. It's just a laser beam, an infrared laser beam forming an optical dipole trap, trapping a spin mixture of lithium-6 atoms. Lithium-6 atoms are here. A spin mixture, two spin states. And what is very important, there is a, a Feshkov resonance, magnetically field um, dependent resonance, which shown here. They put the field to 800 something Gauss, where the interaction is very, very strong, and the S wave scattering length diverges. So we have interaction control in the experiments using these Feshkov resonance phenomena. And here it was very important. And what they observed then looked like this. After there is a time of flight expansion, and Immediately after the expansion, you see almost the initial shape, the cigar shape, but then you see 
that the crowd does not expand ballistically, but just be round at the end. No, it expands hydrodynamically uh, in the sample. And that was very exciting because if you work with weakly interacting Bose-Einstein condensates, you know, I mean, hydrodynamic expansion is one of the signatures of Bose-Einstein condensation. Here it is actually not, but it's still a precursor of some kind of superfluid state. It's strongly connected to the fact that it's strongly interacting the Fermi gas. And I want to measure, mention another experiment from 2003, 19 years ago. That is the molecule formation in the Fermi gas. So that's an experiment by David Jin in her group at Gila in Boulder. And she worked with a spin mixture of potassium atoms, different spin states. And um, okay, this picture here shows just the Stan Gala separation of the, of the crowd into these two different spin states. So when they cross <coughs> the Feshbach resonance, they see the signal gets weaker. Somehow atoms get lost. But they are not completely lost. If you apply a radio frequency pulse with the right frequency, then you see something else happening. You see something is coming back. Actually, not at the location of these atomic blocks. There's somewhere something in the center. And this is a cloud of dimers formed by Feshbach association, which are then um, dissociated by the radio frequency, which are imaged as atoms. So this is a signature of molecule formation, Feshbach molecules formed in the Fermi gas. And this is very important and exciting, because what you see is if you put two fermions together, and you form a composite particle, it's obviously you get a boson. So it changes the quantum statistics. <coughs> then you can ask, OK, can these bosons condense? Yes, the answer was given just a few months later, and they can condense. We observed at the end of 2003 that our super shallow dipole trap could contain many more atoms than it offers quantum states to the fermionic atoms. Something else is happening. We get 10 times more particles into the trap than the fermionic nature would allow. So we interpreted this as both Einstein condensation. And this interpretation was correct. A little bit later, we saw also bimodal behavior in the same way that also David Jin and her group had seen here, bimodality in their profile, and the Kettler group at MIT. And this was the starting point, actually, of many, many experiments over almost two decades on um, BCBCS crossover physics. The system, depending on the magnetic detuning, can have both Einstein character, on the other side of the resonance, BCS type character. And in the center, you get a so called unitary Fermi gas with the strongest interaction that is allowed by <coughs> quantum mechanics. OK, and then another slide on superfluidity. Later, a couple of experiments have demonstrated superfluidity. We had seen some hints in collective modes, <coughs> but the experiment of pair condensation at Gila in 2004 and vortex formation in, at MIT in 2005 made it crystal clear. And we could also contribute a few observations related to the superfluid nature, like the quenching of the moment of inertia. You see that the cloud which uh, if you put the cloud into slow rotation, no vortices are formed, but you can measure the um, angular momentum of the cloud. And then you will find that the superfluid part does not carry angular momentum, cannot carry angular momentum, unless you form uh, vortices. And so you observe a quenching, a reduction of the moment of inertia below the superfluid transition. And another experiment that was actually carried out in Innsbruck with the collaboration of with Sandro Stringal and Lev Pitayevsky from Trento was the observation of second sound that in a superfluid you have an additional sound mode. Uh, here is the second sound which disappears as soon as the sample is no longer superfluid. Okay, so this is a brief history, some important milestones. I'll come back to a few things a little bit later. Just want to mention one more thing. Why with Fermi gases? There's one important ingredient, and this is the collisional stability which they can have. Usually our enemy, if we work with strongly interacting quantum gases, is three-body decay. So two of them form a dimer, and the atom is there to carry away the binding energy. This is the three-body process, three atoms together, one dimer and one atom, and a lot of binding energy is released. Exactly this process can be very strongly suppressed if you work with fermions, because in a three-body process, 
in a two-state sp two spin mixture, you inevitably have two identical fermions involved. And this suppresses the three-body decay. In particular, if you have so-called broad Feshkov resonances where the suppression effect, it can be extremely strong and make the situation <coughs> very stable. And if you've worked, for example, with the resonant lithium-6 Fermi gas on top of the resonance, infinite scattering length, the system can be even more stable than maybe if you work with rubidium, the rubidium both Einstein condensate. Well, this effect is extremely important. So that means there's really a very important difference in the experiments. For photons, <coughs> if you have resonant scattering properties, you usually have very fast decay. This can reveal also interesting physics like three-body states. Also, the group of Jan has considered the three-body decay in that regime. And um, in the case of fermions, they can be collisionally stable. At least scattering, inelastic scattering can be suppressed by a factor of 1,000 or something like this, and you can have long-lived states you know, in your trap. Important difference. I come back to this a little bit later. Okay, now this was my brief historic review, some basic <coughs> ideas in the field. Now it's time for the first part. Um, so experiments on impurities in the Fermi C. So we can work with potassium and for, uh, atoms, ozonic potassium 40, fermionic uh, potassium-40 and bosonic potassium-41 in the Fermi C of lithium-6. For the system lithium-6, it's very similar to what I have introduced before, <coughs> but now I have additional impurities in it. It will be the next maybe 25 minutes of the talk, and then I switch to another topic, which is progress towards a new mixture, putting this prosium and potassium atoms together with the goal to create exotic superfluids. And I think we have made important progress towards this goal. Okay, coming to the impurities. Okay, so um, we now have a situation where we have a large Fermi C of atoms, here are the blue ones here, and we have a few impurity atoms. And so these impurities in the Fermi C, they have been called Fermi polaron, going to work back from 2009 by the Zwierlein group at MIT. So we're looking at Fermi polarons, quasi-particles of impurities in the Fermi C. Okay, so we don't consider a bosonic medium. This is done very nicely here in, in, in Norris. Um, I don't speak about the boson polaron, maybe a few <coughs> words about this. Um, so we are interested, interested in impurities, and these can be fermions or bosons in the Fermi C. Then there are a lot of research questions, interesting research questions. So, um, in general, what are the quasi-particle properties, static and dynamic quasi-particle properties, interaction energies, energy shifts, how stable are the quasi-particles, how are they formed, what is the formation dynamics, but also what happens if these quasi-particles move, and what happens if you have enough quasi-particles so that they're dense enough so that mediated interactions can become important, and what is the role of the impurity quantum statistics. Well, these are some questions I will touch in the next 20 minutes. But here I want to introduce a team working in the lab. This is the lab in the background. Here are members of the team, the current PhD students. Isabella, okay, Isabella is no longer a PhD student. She finished last year, staying a little bit longer in Innsbruck. Cosetta and Erich, PhD students. Adrian, a master student. Postdoc Bo Juan, senior scientist Emil Kirillov, and myself. And uh, we work in the lab at the Alcopi Institute. And our system is, this is quite similar to what I've introduced already. Uh, we have an infrared optical dipole trap, just a standard <coughs> 1064 nanometer infrared light. And we have a lithium Fermi C in it. And it's produced first by evaporative cooling in a spin mixture, but then one spin component is removed. And we have a single spin state and this is the lowest one in the system, about 10 to the 5 atoms, and temperatures are around 150 nanokelvin, which is about 17% of the Fermi temperature. <coughs> okay, and now we add some impurities. Here are the impurities. And uh, the impurities <coughs> can be potassium-40 or potassium-41 atoms, Potassium-40 are fermions, potassium-41 are bose impurities. 
and we have typically 10 to 20 times less impurity atoms than we have um, atoms in the frequency. <coughs> and the concentration in the center, they sit in the center of the trap, is um, locally about between 10% or 50%. And we see what the influence is of this not zero concentration. Okay, and very important ingredient, we have tunable interaction. We have a Feshbach resonance. In both cases, we find Feshbach resonances. They are a little bit different field, but the character is very much the same. So we can switch from boson to fermions and see what is the difference in quantum statistics of the impurities. The most simple method to probe the system is radio frequency injection <coughs> spectroscopy. So we look at two different spin states of the impurity atom. Okay, we start in one state, which is weakly interacting with the medium. Weakly interacting means usual scattering length, 60 times the Bohr radius or something like this, just enough to provide elastic collisions to thermalize. But if you want to look at strong interactions, it's extremely weak and it has almost negligible effect, the interaction. And there is another state, and in this state, the system shows a Feshbach resonance. So we can tune the relative interaction to resonant, and then the spectrum of excitation gets much broader, gets broadened, and, um, and again, we, can, we are interested in the spectral function, which we probe by radio frequency transfer. So we inject from the non-interacting state into this tunable, strongly interacting state, and see how the response depends on the interparticle interaction, the interspecies interaction. OK, so the next one, OK, some details for the experimentalists. <coughs> the system is set in such a way that without the interaction, we drive pi pulses. We transfer all the population from this state and the other one. We use Blackman pulses, which don't have side lobes. And the spectral resolution is something like 700 hertz, which is 4% of the thermal. <coughs> Good, the next one is also more technical. Okay, it is just the spin states involved. I don't go to the details. The Feshbach resonance here sits for the bosons at 157 Gauss, for the fermions at 335 Gauss. And actually, I see that it's wrong. It's the other way around. This number should be here. The numbers should be interchanged. Uh, but it doesn't matter, really, for the principle and the frequencies we're working with are close to 40 or 60 megahertz. But these are just some technical details. OK, now I introduce the interaction parameter, the quantity that characterizes the dimensionless quantity characterizing the interaction. We call it capital X. And it's minus 1 over the Fermi wave function times the scattering length, A. OK, what does it mean? The Fermi wave number is um, the inverse interparticle distance with some prefactor of order one. The Fermi energy we calculate in the usual way. And typically, these length scales, one over kf, corresponds to 4,000 times the Bohr radius. <coughs> OK, to make it strong in the action, we have to get to these values of the scattering length. That's what we can do using our Feshbach resonance, which is an S-wave scattering length, geomagnetically tunable. And we find that under our conditions, the strongly interacting regime is just 15 milligauss wide. So for the experimentalists to control on the milligauss level on more than a few hundred gauss, it's already some kind of challenge, but I think we master this in the experiment. Good, so um, here is one of the first results we got in the impurity system long ago, or almost <coughs> yeah, 10, 10 years now. And we looked at this injection spectrum. And then you see, if you go to the Feshbach resonance, here's the resonance. If you approach it from the lower side, where the scattering length is positive, the energy is upshifted. And then somehow the signal fades out and disappears. And here for attractive interactions, the negative A, the energy is shifted down and the signal disappears. What you see here is what we call the quasi-particle, the polaron. And then it's on top of incoherent excitations. If we look at the full spectrum, we took it a little bit later in experiments in 2016. We see a nice polaron peak here in the spectrum on the repulsive side, and a broad pedestal <coughs> of incoherent excitations of typical width of the Fermi energy. The same also for the attractive polaron. 
Okay. And do we understand what we see here? Yes. And here I am very grateful for a long-standing collaboration that we have with you, Georg, and also with Pietro Massignan from ICFO Spain. It started around this time on the Polaron properties. And here the solid lines show the results of a T-matrix approach based on single particle hole excitations to calculate the Polaron energy in the single impurity delimit. And it fits quite well. There might be some little deviations, which also have a physical reason. What happens between the two dashed lines, actually there, and we call it the molecule hole continuum, where the impurity atom can recombine with an atom from the Fermi C and they form a molecule. And that can happen in a broad spectrum, which we investigated in detail in other experiments. I don't want to discuss it anymore. Uh, but we understand this disappearance of the attractive polaron peak here. We understand because it crosses into the molecule all continuum <coughs> and the polarons become unstable and decay into molecules. Here for the so-called repulsive polaron, it's a different decay mechanism, but it also decays into, at the end, in molecular excitations down there. Good, so we understand basically what we see there. We did many more experiments, but I now want to come to a question in the Fermi C. What will change if I leave the Fermi C the same as it was before, lithium-6, but if I change the impurity character from fermion, potassium-40, to boson, potassium-41? What will change? What do you think will change? Okay, let me see. So this is what I've shown before, the fermion case. Now, with the same method, I show, uh, we took a spectrum on the bosonic impurities. I mean, then the color coding is a little bit, the color map is a little bit different, but it's the same experiment, and it looks like this. The range is a little bit different, and the colors are a little bit different, but what you see, the repulsive polaron here, the attractive polaron crosses into the molecule whole con continuum, some excitations in the center, hard to see it in this graph, but it's basically the same. But here, we worked under conditions where the bosonic impurities, the bosons, they can condense. But we worked under thermal conditions where we were slightly above the condensation temperature. Okay, so that means thermal impurities slightly above the condensation temperature, bosonic nature, we have almost the same as the fermion impurities, at least to the extent we can see here. But does nothing really change? We look again into this spectrum, the same graph I've shown before, but now we change the temperature from 19% of the Fermi temperature of lithium, a little bit below to, I think, 16% or 15%, for 14%. This. <coughs> and then we get a partially condensed impurity curve, and you see the spectrum. Well, you still see the polaronic branches, repulsive and attractive polaron. But you see an additional branch with little energy shift. And this apparently comes from the Bose-Einstein condensate that it's formed in the impurity cloud. So what is the situation here? The situation, so a new branch is that we have an inhomogeneous situation. We have this Fermi C in the trap, okay, and we have a cloud of thermal impurities in the center. And in the very center, even much smaller, there's a BC. And as you all know, the BC has a much higher density, about 30 or 40 times higher than the impurity cloud. What happens in the center, that they change role. Here we have a dense bosonic cloud with a few fermi at fermionic atoms in it, and it's more the opposite situation. It's the case of bosopolarons, basically, but we probe on the, on the, still on the, then on the majority, which is different from the experiments here. Okay, so uh, a remark I have to make <coughs> is um, that if you do this, create such a situation with large interspecies scattering length, the static situation, what you would see is either collapse of the cloud by attractive interaction or phase separation <coughs> for repulsive interaction. But we do this experiment fast enough so the collapse dynamics and uh, phase separation is clearly slower. So I think we are not affected or have only weak effects of this phase separation or collapse. That's my remark I want to make. We study it separately. 
Okay, that are the regions in the trap. So it's an inhomogeneous situation where the branch in the center comes from these dense bosons, the condensate. And the polaronic branches come from the thermal cloud, which you see here, the thermal cloud. Okay, so we looked a little bit more into this bosal polaron question, but it's just very rough experiments. We see there's a little energy shift if we vary the concentration. <coughs> That is the PEC concentration. It's much higher than what we have in the Fermi gas. And there is an energy shift, which we can roughly explain in a kind of back axis model, looking at the energy, interaction energy between the two species. But this is just some rough demonstration of something that is probably related to the bose polaron question. We have to come back to this question maybe a little bit later. But here we are, you see it, data scatter a lot. We were quite affected also by fluctuations in the interaction parameter, the exact magnetic field, and also temperature. Okay, um, but we didn't, we haven't dig deeper into this question. But now I come to come to another question. How about induced interactions between the polaris? Now we have more impurities, and so somehow they overlap, at least the dressing clouds will overlap. And to what extent can I understand this in Landau's thermoliquid theory? Or are there phenomena beyond it? OK, as experimentalists, what we do is we carry out experiments and we vary the impurity concentration by different loading times and so on, trying to keep all other conditions constant, but just changing the impurity concentration and measure energy shifts. Turned out to be quite hard to do this. I mean, you have to do many, many experiments and uh, have different concentrations and extract them the, the data. But I can show some results. <coughs> now, this is actually if we are in the repulsive regime, already strongly interacting, then we see you see a clear energy shift here. Okay, there's no doubt there's an energy shift with the impurity concentration. Here it's 50% of the impurities. And um, we find always, for all measurements we do, we can nicely fit it with the linear behavior. OK, so we analyze it based on the linear behavior. And one thing we can do is we can extrapolate to zero. Previous experiments, we were somewhere here, maybe, with the concentration. Uh, and we are probably somehow a little bit affected by density-induced effects. But here we can extrapolate to zero. If we do it, we, we get this. Um, extrapolated zero concentration energy shifts <coughs> and we can compare it with theory and it fits perfectly. Okay? But how if I do it at higher concentration somewhere, let's say 0.4. Let's go here. Okay, let's take show the same the experimental data for 0.4 concentration for variable interaction parameter. And then it looks like this. You see there is a clear effect so that the shift is less. The energy shift is reduced. Also here, it's less energy shift by these overlapping polarons. So it's, I can think one can state it's a clear observation of an energy shift mediated somehow by the interactions. What exactly the mechanism is, we don't know. Uh, we have some ideas. And um, another thing we can extract is the slope, the linear slope. We extract it to zero. The value at zero concentration, now we extract the slope. Okay, and then for the slope, we get this data here in the weakly interacting regime. So these are only, these are only the weakly interacting data up to x minus plus, plus minus one. And you see there's an energy shift which is just a few percent, not much of the Fermi energy, but it kind of is consistent with. This is a theory provided to us by Pietro and, and Georg on the applying Landau Fermi liquid theory in the weakly interacting regime. And it kind of fits. It seems to be consistent. OK, but we were, of course, looking into the strongly interacting regime. And now I have to expand the scale a little bit. Then it looks like this. Then you see for strongly interacting conditions, that's the data set you know, uh, is. Um, the shifts are much larger. And this is a, still a big puzzle for us. We discussed this today, this morning, possible reasons. So for us, it's a big puzzle. So this simple Landau-Fermi liquid type approach 
looking at the atom, number of atoms in the dressing cloud and so on, this does not fit here and something else is going on. And one possible explanation might be that we discussed that here we have a molecular component and with this molecular component this leads to these strong upshifts. So there are some first indications that this would be consistent, but we have to see. This is work in progress, but an exciting question. Good, so a um, little bit into the future, what are we going to do next? And one open question is <coughs> motion effects on the polaron. <coughs> what happens if I move the polaron to the cloud? And what is the relevant velocity scale? It would be the Fermi velocity of the medium. So I can expect if I approach the Fermi velocity of the medium, the Fermions can no longer follow the dressing cloud and the picture should change. That's actually a question I've started to look into with Richard, Richard Schmidt a couple of years ago, but now we are close to doing experiments like this. So if you look at the Fermi speed, it is uh, at the Fermi energies we have, it's typically something like 44 millimeter per second. <coughs> now how can we probe this? And one nice tool uh, would be Raman transitions. So we can actually replace our, we can replace our radio frequency transition with an optical Raman transition. And if you do it with counter-propagating beams, you get a photon momentum transfer of two times the photon momentum. You can do it with co-propagating beams, no photon momentum, then it should be exactly the same as for the uh, uh, radio frequency excitation. Or you can do it with counter-propagating beams, then we have 2h two, two per k. And if you calculate what is the velocity change by 2h per k, then you see it is 26 millimeters per second, which is half of the Fermi speed. So it should be relatively easy to do this experiment moving with half of the Fermi speed to the medium. I would already expect quite substantial modifications. Or well, it's also possible to have in an extended Raman scheme 4 h per k. And then we have the Fermi speed. And these are experiments we are preparing right now. Good. And ah, these are what I wanted to show, just um, proof of principle. I, I don't want to go through all these pictures. It's just Rabi oscillations induced by Raman beams under different conditions. And it works really very nicely. Uh, you see the nice contrast of the, ramps of, of, the, of, the, of the fringes of these Rabi oscillations. It works very nicely. And it works also very nicely if the push is to the limits. We can actually <coughs> look at the time scale. This is a microsecond only here. So we have a, a pi pulse duration here of 250 nanoseconds. And this now allows us to enter a new regime where the pi pulse duration is much shorter than the Fermi time, Fermi energy time divided by h bar, which is about five microseconds in our case. And previous experiments on, yeah, let me just mention it briefly, on Ramsey spectroscopy on this impurity cloud, which we have carried out, were limited by the finite duration of the pulses. Mm -hmm. With radio frequency, we can do maybe uh, 25 microseconds or something like this. That's what we can do. but. Um, not below the Fermi time, but here we can go two orders of magnitude faster, and uh, that's very interesting for a new generation of experiments using this Ramsey excitation scheme. So that's some <coughs> new uh, developments going on in this experiment. Yeah, and now it's time, okay, just to conclude on the Fermi polaron. I think we have quite a good understanding of the static quasi-particle properties, stability of the polarons, the lifetime of the formation dynamics. We start to understand this work in progress, impurity, impurity interactions. At least we have seen clear interactions. Uh, we uh, understand aspects of the impurity quantum statistics, and we started experiments into the motional effects. But there are more questions like, for example, are there few body effects could um, um, influence the system? Or another interesting topic, no one has ever started, studied light impurities. Here we have heavy impurities in the Fermi sea of light atoms. No one has started the opposite system. And I think we now have a new system with new with properties to do that. But that's the next part of my talk. OK? So this was about the <coughs> impurity physics. And uh, now, in the remaining time, I want to introduce a new system. We are having a lot of fun with this new system mixing disposium atoms with potassium atoms, both fermionic. <coughs> oh.
Okay, so um, this is a spin mixture. I'm going back to lithium-6 or potassium-40 in a spin mixture. So um, you can extend this. So now a nice extension is you create imbalance. You have more of one, space, uh, of one spin state than the other spin state. Spin imbalance, or you can also call it polarization. And this, of course, introduces some new physics. It has been extensively considered in experiments about 10 to 15 years ago. And an extreme case, of course, is one impurity in the Fermi C, uh, or no impurity in the Fermi C. It's a matter of taste. Okay, but this is a situation <coughs> of polarized Fermi gases that have been considered in quite many experiments and a lot of theory. And um, here is a phase diagram of these polarized Fermi gas from Hank Stove's work. So this is a mean field approach which shows the qualitative features, right? Quantitatively, I mean, the numbers are not, have to be changed or reduced by a factor of two to three. But it shows at least what happens if there's no polarization, spin mixture. Of course, if you have zero temperature, it's superfluid. If you increase the temperature, there's transition to a normal. So SF is superfluid, N is normal. But now let me introduce some spin imbalance then at zero temperature, I am in FR, which does not mean Feshbach resonance. It means in this plot, forbidden region. It's a region where the system phase separates. Actually, the phase separates in a way that some atoms uh, pair up. They form pairs uh, in the sample. And there is um, the excess number of particles, unpaired particles, then is expelled, and they phase separate in the trap. So it's an unstable situation. Only finite temperature can stabilize it again. And then here is the so-called tricritical point. On the other side, the same. So this is symmetric. I mean, if in a spin mixture, if you have more from the one spin or the other spin, it's a symmetric situation. Good. So what do I want to tell you? I have experimental work. There has been a lot of experimental work. And one paper kind of summarizes many things by the Kettler group. And this is the, the map to face boundaries in a, uh, such spinning balance forming us. And you see exactly here these, what was FR before the unstable region, the tricritical point, the superfluid phase, and here it's the normal phase. And of course, I mean, because it's a spin, uh, uh, spin mixture, it should be a symmetric situation. I've just put the mirror image here. So that's the phase diagram basically you've seen before and you will see again here. Okay. This is now quite well understood. There are a lot of papers, theory papers, on looking for exotic phases, exotic pairing phases. And they find in certain regions there are some, maybe very close to this point, hard to see, there might be regions where at very, very low temperature you get other pairing phases, where, so FFLO type phases, where particles pair up and don't get zero momentum, but they have finite momentum. So, so, so to say, pairs with finite momentum. This can be in both directions, so traveling wave or standing wave effects, FF and LO effect. But um, these are theory papers, and these have not been observed experimentally. And the reason simply is you have to go to really super low temperature. So exotic pairing phases may exist in the phase diagram for experimentalists. If you ask an experimentalist, can you produce an alcohol called Fermi gas at a temperature which is a one thousandth of the Fermi temperature? I would be rather pessimistic. Okay, so it is very difficult to reach in spin mixtures. Okay, but coming back to this illustration, here we have the polarization or population imbalance. But you can add more imbalance. You can add new degree of freedom mass imbalance. So here you have more blue heavy ones than the other ones, and here it's the other way around. You can play with the mass of the system. And you can also have imbalance in both. Here's a situation where you have population imbalance and you have mass imbalance. You have more heavy guys than light guys. Okay, that's actually the particular interesting situation. So, okay, how do we change the mass of an atom? Now, okay, it's not so easy. Maybe you can play a little bit with effective masses and so on in the lattice. But um, the, the, the most direct way is you just choose a not a spin mixture, but a species mixture. You put different elements together. And then um, what can you expect? And there's this phase diagram. Again, you have seen it. 
And this calculation shows the phase diagram now with the mass imbalance, factor 7 in this case, but it, that's not very sensitive to it, should look like this. On the right hand side, positive P, you see basically the same. Your forbidden region, tricuspid point, superfluid phase. Nothing very exciting. But on the other side here, it gets very exciting because now there is a so called LP standing for Lifshitz point. And there's where the standard kind of Cooper pairs become unstable towards finite momentum. Below this point, somehow the interesting stuff is happening. I mean, Hank Stoff used SS for super solid phases, but it's more in general phase with broken symmetry, um, like FFLO phases here. So the interesting things would happen below this point. That's where all theoreticians, I think, would, would, would agree. There are no good predictions of what would uh, happen exactly where. But that's the interesting stuff. So here's the interesting region. And exciting things happen if you now look at the temperature scale. Of course, it's a matter of how you define the Fermi temperature for, for mass, mass imbalance system. But you see 0.2. And 0.2 does not sound very dramatic. I mean, we can easily get to 10% of the Fermi temperature. So this is in a temperature range, which we may access in experiments. Looks promising. But that's now the main motivation for the work on our species mixtures of dysposium and potassium. So you can say why uh, dysposium and potassium. You need two different fermions. Eight different species have been brought to degeneracy in the last 20 years or so. Of course, there are just common ones, lithium-6 and potassium-40. There are other ones, strontium-87, chromium-53, dysposium-161, erbium-167, ytterbium isotopes, and which ones to choose. So you need some criteria. Criteria are you should have a decent mass ratio, not too small. Of course, if you have 1.1, it's almost 1. But um, if it's too large, then you, again, you can have Yefimov states, which make the system unstable. So something around 5 may be nice. Yeah? So and then you have other criteria. You would need systems where you can at least expect tunability, Feshbach resonances. <clears throat> and this is not the case for strontium, ytterbium because of the closed shell structure, and so on. And then just a few options are left. And um, actually, it turns out the obvious one, lithium potassium, we investigated this in more detail. It has no broad Feshbach resonances, only narrow resonances, and no good collisional stability. So this standard one does not work. In Florence, they investigated lithium and chromium. We were waiting for the results. Now they have understanding of the lithium chromium system. Unfortunately, also only narrow resonances at kilogram spheres. But our choice was potassium plus dysprosium. And in the, these um, submerged shell atoms with an inner shell which is not closed, you, many bizarre things can happen. And we just have to understand so this would be obvious, but it doesn't work for the supervirts. Our choice is this one. But we have to understand the interaction properties. No one, there was absolutely no knowledge on this. You have to start from scratch. You don't know. You take full risk. Can be very bad, the interaction properties, only losses and no resonances. But we took the risk and we started experiments on that. And it took quite some while, a couple of years. And now we don't understand it fully. I think no one will ever understand it fully. But we understand at least certain interesting properties of the system. OK, before coming to that, let me introduce the team members. I mean, these are it's the past team. They built up the experiment and carried out the first experiments. Now we have kind of a generation experiments. And these guys here took over. And um, now we are again, after this generation change and after all the COVID time, which slowed down everything, we are again in a very productive phase. OK, so for the experimentalists, I mean, is um, Cooling properties, actually, <coughs> dysprosium, I mean, the level scheme looks a little bit scary, many, many levels. That's usually what laser coolers don't like. But you have selection rules, and you find um, a strong cooling transition here at 421 nanometer, which can be used for slowing an atomic beam. Um, and uh, then you can operate, actually, a magneto-optical trap on this line, 626 nanometer, which has about 150 kilohertz line width. And there are more narrow transitions which you can use for narrow line cooling. So it's very easy to prepare the system using a 421 nanometer Zeeman slower, 
626 nanometer magneto optical cleft, then you get down to 10 microcaven or even a little bit less. Very convenient for loading an optical diaper drop. For potassium, what we use is the so called D1 subdoppler cooling, gray molasses cooling, which also produces similar temperatures. And so the message is just if I don't go into detail. But the preparation of the system is quite easy. It's the, the species like each other, there are no major problems bringing them together. And to create the mixture with a few microcalvin is relatively easy. That's already quite good news. Then, how do we do further cooling? Actually, we have a single dipole trap, <coughs> optical dipole trap, an infrared laser usually. And uh, the potassium atoms are much more polarizable than the dysposium atoms. Dysposium atoms have um, about 3.2 times less polarizability at these wavelengths. So it means the trap is just more shallow. <coughs> and then we have gravity, and dysposium is much heavier than potassium. So we have a combination of two, trap in two, two traps a relatively shallow trap for disposing where the atoms can escape, and a deep trap for potassium. That means in our case, if we do evaporative cooling, potassium would be the cooling agent, and, uh, uh, sorry, the other way around, disposing would be the cooling agent, and the potassium atoms are just sympathetically cooled. And this works super well, super nicely, because we have dipolar collisions, and so even we have a Fermi gas of disposing, in a single spin state, and you usually learn in a single spin state you don't get elastic collisions. But this is not true for the strongly magnetic atoms, because of the long-range dipole-dipole interaction, you always have a nice cross-section for collisions. And so evaporative cooling of this posium 161 in a single spin state is as easy as it is for the atoms. So this works very well, and we get to nice conditions. With this posium, we get down, I mean, typically to 10% of the Fermi temperature then the, it's for potassium even colder. I don't want to go to details, but this works very well. Okay, cooling to deep degeneracy done. Now comes the difficult part. Do we have a control knob here, which we can turn to control the interaction, tune the magnetic field to resonance, study unitarity, limited quantum ground system, like this. Okay, we look into the fashion of resonances and Already in the first experiments now done, I think three years ago, we saw many scary things. So the resonance is everywhere. This is just between 50 and 61 miles. <laughs> there are super many resonances in this posium alone. We typically have 50 super narrow resonances per Gauss. Resonance is 50 per Gauss. And this posium alone. And for the mixture, you have also resonances. Not as many, maybe one or two per Gauss in on average. And so then we started many experiments concerning these forests of resonances with different related fields, which you can imagine is quite time consuming. You don't know, will you be rewarded at the end? Or does the experiment die in losses? Okay, we found something interesting actually near 200 grams. This is the thermalization measurement. We prepare potassium and disposal together in the trap, but potassium is heated a little bit. So this has 3.5 microcalvin, this is 1.5 microcalvin in near thermal uh, regime. And then we see there are certain magnetic fields indicated by the arrows where there's very fast thermalization. What does it mean? It means we have resonances, broader resonances with uh, poles here, the resonance poles. And we can understand this basically as a scenario of three broader resonances, pole here, pole there, pole there, and so how can we <coughs> characterize that? Uh, we use actually a product formula for Feshbach resonances, which is valid for overlapping resonances, can be written in that way. Here the CI, these are the zero crossings, where the scattering length goes to zero. And PI are the poles of the resonance features. And then we need a background. And then, how do we get this A background? We get it from the cross-section, so we have to get some information on the thermal installation. And here, I am actually, uh, we apply a model, and I'm very happy that Marcel is here, because this is the model we developed in Heidelberg more than 20 years ago for the interspecies thermalization between lithium and potassium. And since then, I mean, it has been used by many groups to do that. And we routinely use this now to get the A background here with this model. And um, yeah, that's our result then. So 
we see we can characterize the poles and the zero crossings, and we need the, we have the background scattering, so it looks like this. So this is our scenario. And it tells us there's a broad resonance near 217 Gauss. Good. Can we do something interesting with this resonance? Now we look back 20 years. The John Thomas experiment, hydrodynamic expansion. So it would be an obvious choice to do something similar, hydrodynamic expansion experiments with a mixture. Okay, here you see such an experiment. We prepare a mixture. Not degenerate, but close to degeneracy, disposium and potassium, and we release the mixture from the trap. Okay, and then here we have a ballistic expansion. Disposium is, or potassium is by a factor of four lighter, means by a factor of two faster the expansion. <coughs> and we see disposium cloud expands slowly, potassium cloud expands fast, as we expect for thermal equilibrium, ballistic expansion of thermal equilibrium. But this is done near a zero crossing with weak interaction or no interaction. If we do the same on top <coughs> of the resonance, we jump on top of the resonance with our magnetic field, do the same experiment, the picture drastically changes. Now you see the potassium cloud is smaller, much smaller, and kind of confined in the expanding disposal cloud. What happens is they expand together. There are many, many collision, collision rates like crazy. Tens of kilohertz or so, they collide. And though this slows the expansion of potassium down, makes it almost as large as for the, for the disposal. We call it a locked expansion, a locked hydrodynamic expansion. And um, then we look at the spatial profiles, we see something funny. We see a bimodality. We were extremely excited seeing this. In the potassium component, we saw a bimodality, narrow component, the broader pedestal. And the reason why we were so excited is for spin mixtures, the bimodality in the minority component is a signature of superfluidity. So we were very excited. When we looked at the temperature around the Fermi temperature, this cannot be the case. Actually, there is something else going on, and uh, we understand it now. What happens is that, um, I mean, the potassium atoms move, perform something like a Brownian motion in the expanding disposing cloud. But sometimes they reach the outer region, and then they are released from this hydrodynamic core, and they expand ballistically. And this creates this pedestal. We can understand it, and we have um, no superfluidity. It's a generic effect of collision with hydrodynamics. And we can understand it, and this is the result of a Monte Carlo simulation for the same conditions. So just collisional dynamics. And we see these pedestals. OK, we can analyze this more in a more quantitative way, looking into how many atoms are in the central core. And then we can plot it. The experimental result, I think, are the, the, the black ones, the filled dots, and the open red ones are from the simulations. So we understand what is going on in collision hydrodynamics with extremely large collision rate. But nevertheless, it's nice to see, I mean, this hydrodynamic, strong hydrodynamic behavior is always a precursor then of other things happening. Collision and stability, I mean, tree body decay. And we did a lot of loss measurements. And we see the typical lifetimes are at least a few hundred milliseconds. And from these measurements, we can extract the recombination coefficients, which are, uh, if you work with three body recombination, maybe you can interpret these values 10 to the minus 25 cubic centimeter to the power of 6 over seconds. <coughs> and I can, can, can compare it with the result, for example, on Orvis experiments. Here, the potassium rubidium. And all these experiments on resonance are 10 to the minus 23 or 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 21 centimeter to the sixth power of a second. Whereas we are in the Fermi Fermi mixture, a few orders of magnitude lower. So we have, I would claim, something like two to four orders of magnitude. We see this Pauli suppression effect. It is definitely there. Otherwise, something would decay within less than a millisecond. OK, now is superfluidity rich? Um, actually, we have a very, very nice collaboration with Giancarlo Strinati, an expert on these superfluids. And he modeled with his group exactly the situation that we have, the trapped situation, the, trap, the, the trapping depth, and the mass imbalance, and so on, in a self-consistent key matrix approach, which is very known to be very good for the mass balance systems. And I just want to show this diagram. It is a phase diagram for the trapped system. 
So here's the majority of disposium, what we usually have in the experiments, majority of potassium. Temperatures in terms of the Fermi temperature of disposium, you see the Lifshitz point here. And here you should get a superfluid below that line. And in the experiments, we are typically here. So we are not there, but it's not a long way to go. I think with some improvement for resonance superfluid, we should end up, we are able to enter this regime. OK, so this is then the outlook. I mean, we have um, shown that we can cool in the deeply determinant regime. We can tune the interaction by a broad resonance. We have power suppression effect. Looks all very nice and very promising. Good reasons to be very optimistic. But, but there's still one problem. This deep cooling here that was done at low field, a few hundred milligrams. And these experiments are done in high field, 220 pounds. And if you ramp up your field, then you cross many resonances. You have problems for the experimentalists with eddy currents in the apparatus and so on. This makes it a bit, a bit difficult. It makes it really very hard, particularly in, in, in view of the complex behavior of disposing background losses. So disposing background losses, this is just a loss spectrum, loss in temperature for disposium held, a few hundred milliseconds. <coughs> in the trap as a function of the B field. Then you see there are, this is not experimental noise. These are resonance structures, really. And you see there are some funny points where you have little losses. We can address them, these narrow loss minima. And you can jump on these points, but you have to control the field then within a few milligrams. You can use them. But it's all kind of a com complication. And so, therefore, um, Fast and precise control of the magnetic field is very important. But here, if you look at low field, this now is a range up to one Gauss. And then you see we can nicely resolve loss features of disposing alone. And so we were, what, should we look maybe more into the low field region? We can control it in a little bit better way. And we had a pleasant surprise recently. When the new team started on the experiment, we started to check the low field region again. And we found resonances at low field, not as wide as the one before, not a few 10, ten gauss, but there are narrower resonances. <coughs> and what I show here are just binding energy measurements, just by the standard magnetic field modulation method. Binding energy measurements, a resonance at one gauss, or at least a little bit less, at 970 milligauss, an interspecies resonance a triplet near 3 Gauss, and a nice resonance at 7 Gauss, 7.3 Gauss. Um, and we see here is a thermalization measurement again, which tells us there is a resonance which is not too, which has a delta width of 1 Gauss roughly, and uh, which allows us to control the interactions. And this curvature in the, in the binding energy for the expert tells us there is a universal range. Yeah. And so this looks very promising. And now we explore this resonance in more detail. Here are all the parameters. I don't want to go into detail here. But um, this is a nice resonance for the experiments, not as broad as the one in high field. But for the experimentalists, it's so much easier to control the field at 7 Gauss than it is at 230 Gauss. It has a lot of advantages, in particular avoiding these bad positions for disposal and so on. So we're working now on this resonance. Just to show you this one, this is a repetition of the hydrodynamic expansion experiment, now on the 7 Gauss resonance. So we can do on the 7 Gauss resonance what we did before on the resonance which is higher, but with much better prospects of controlling the field. And um, we can do also something more. We can produce molecules. This is a recent example where we start with a mixture. We ramp across the resonance. Then we apply a stern gala separation, and then we see the disposium atoms going up in the magnetic field gradients, the potassium atoms going down, and chosen, the gradient is chosen in such a way that the molecules stay levitated. It's very similar to uh, what we have seen in Debbie Jean's work in 20 years ago on the molecule formation. One stayed here, one stayed there in the center of the molecules. It's very similar to what we see here. Then what was next? I mean, if you look back these almost 20 years, the next step was formation of molecular Bose-Einstein condensate. And we looked into the properties of this molecular cloud, 
it's super cool and it's it's nearly generously and I uh, hope with some minor improvements we can bring it into generously. So I'm quite optimistic about the BEC of heteronuclear flashback molecules. Okay, so okay, this is some outlook coming. We can create novel superfluids, hopefully, look into full few body states in low dimension and so on, and look into fermipolar ones and the medium of heavy particles. Many things to do. But I think the general conclusion is on the fermions. Alpha cold fermion mixtures are a great playground for physics, of strongly interacting many body physics systems. And there are many opportunities and challenges for experiment and theory ahead of us. Thank you for your attention.